Happy May morning to you. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> I know what Elisa feels like now <laughs> when she tries to get everyone's attention. Good morning. My name is Fred Brunig, and I'm a member of the worship committee. And um, pleased to have Brian Reamer here as our worship leader this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our online uh, congregants and anyone downstairs. Um, is there anyone downstairs, Fred? We don't know yet. Oh, okay. Oh, good. Good, good morning, everyone downstairs. Um, at least uh, we'll be back next Sunday, um, and we will have communion next Sunday. I think the notice about that was was um, in the e news and uh, passed along recently. The um, Let's see, are there, what else do we, I wanted to, um, we had a little, few technical issues this morning. My brain is still sort of zing, zinging around in a, in a circle. So let me just take a minute to center. Maybe we can all do that, to have a nice deep breath. Um, I do want to start with the, with our land acknowledgement. We've been cherishing the, growing relationship that we've developed with Rich Holshu and Melody Walker Mackin, our Beneke friends from the Atawi projects project and um, and we uh, I'm glad that they're helping us develop our relationship to our surroundings, our mother earth and all of our um, the grasses and <clears throat> the grasses and the brook and the, and the stones and the animals and the birds all of our beings and friends and neighbors. So we begin today by acknowledging and honoring the land our church occupies and those original people who belong to this land. We gather on here on the bank, on the bank of Wanaskatok, the broad brook, in the shadow of the great Mount Wantastiquit, in the valley of the rushing Connecticut. I want to go ahead and, sure, well, let's go ahead and light the candles. We'll take a break in our acknowledgement. Amen. We come to worship and discern together the call of God to the United Church of Christ for these days. Let us know that we do so on the homelands of the Sokoki Abeniki, who have lived in relationship with this land for thousands of years and are still living here today. We offer them our gratitude and respect our repentance and hope in solidarity with them. It is a holy communion we share of life on earth, of past and present, of pain and reconciliation, of mystery and majesty. Let us begin. Thank you, Fred, and good morning. good morning. As we begin, I want to give a special thanks uh, to Fran Robert for accompanying us on the piano today. Uh, a call to worship from Revelations. Let every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them sing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might 
forever. Let's have a few moments of meditative silence. Our opening hymn is Open My Eyes, and Peter, can you remind me what? It's in the bulletin. It is in the bulletin. Ah, excellent. Find it in your bulletin, and let's begin with our opening hymn. I invite you all to stand as you are able and willing. take a few moments and in confession and opportunity to, to reflect upon the past week or past few days. <clears throat> God, even though we try to follow you and your teaching, we fall short of both your expectations and of our own. We ask for your forgiveness and your ever-present love as we share those shortcomings silently with you now. For our words of assurance, I ask that we read together the prayer of St. Francis as found in your order of service, your bulletin. Together, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, 
Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is through giving that we receive, it's through pardon that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Okay, it's time now for us to um, have a message for children especially, so I invite young folks to come forward and anybody else who wishes to or wishes to or happens to feel young today, you're welcome to come. Um, I have assisting me, my niece, Ava June, or AJ as she goes by, because that's easier than remembering Ava June. And, James and Lily are here as well. And um, we need to make sure that everybody has a, a piece of paper. So hopefully you received, a, if you came to the sanctuary, a newspaper. Um, and um, Fred or, or Elizabeth, if you can bring up some for our children here. If you're at home, uh, maybe you can find a piece of newspaper or something you don't mind uh, damaging. Uh, because that's what we're, we're going to damage that a little bit. Um, I know some of you are thinking, well, I didn't want to damage my newspaper because I might want to read it instead of what's happening in the service today, but um, I'm sorry to disappoint for that. Um, okay, so uh, AJ, you're going to help me um, demonstrate. That's the word, thank you. So um, if you take your paper and hold it up and... I don't seem to have, if you fold it in half, and then in half again. Sure, Fred, thank you. So half one way and half down the other. Then you have a, a corner here where they all intersect. If you can just tear off a tiny little bit of that so that you make a hole that will end up in the middle, like that. So, Catherine's got one to demonstrate. It can be about the size of a quarter or a dime or half dollar, something like that. Okay. So, so just a little hole like that. And maybe help these guys turn off just a little bit. Yeah, got it. Mine is really tiny. So, I love that. Okay, I see some of you have already figured out that, that with a little hole you can look through it, right? So that's what I'm going to ask you folks to do is first look through the hole and then look at something in the distance. So if you're in the sanctuary here, you might look at the cross, you might look at somebody standing here. If you're this way, you might look at the window out the back. But hold it up close to your face, look through the hole with one eye closed and, and then gradually move the paper away from your face and keep looking at that thing in the distance. And you've got it at arm's length, you're still looking through the hole. So my question now is, how has what you're looking at changed? What ideas do you guys have about how what you looked at changed? Okay, Catherine says for her it looks larger. What do you guys notice when you look through? It's like a hole with a face. Oh, it's like a hole with, like a hole with a face. Okay. What's something you notice? Oh, I noticed that my view of the whole room was bigger when it was close to my face, but then I could only just see one thing further away. Okay, the, when it was close to her face, the view of the whole room was bigger, but then further away, it was a lot smaller. What did you? Okay, so when he holds it far away, it's littler, and when it's close, he can see more. Okay, so any other thoughts from anybody else about what you notice? You can see less. Okay, and Patrice? There are fewer distractions, the object is more singular. 
There's fewer distractions. Fewer distractions. The object is more singular. Yes, Josh. Um, I've been looking at this, this thing, this Christmas cross on the wall. And uh, whenever I so so it looks like the, the cross is actually part of the, the newspaper interesting sort of adding it to the daily news the with the word of God yeah Okay, good. So what's interesting, um, yes, it does change your perspective. You see something different. I didn't hear anybody say that what you saw different also included the paper, your hands, and things outside of the, the paper. There's all this stuff going on outside, right? So this is like how we often see things is that we see things through a small hole. We pay attention to little things like what we saw on television last night or what somebody said to us, a friend, and how that made us feel. And we focus on something that's small, but Jesus wants us to see a bigger picture and wants us to see more things. If we listen to what Jesus says and the stories he tells, then we learn to see the world bigger. We care more about other people and the planet. Okay? So that's what I have to say for children today. Let me end with a brief par prayer. God, please help us to listen to the lessons of Jesus so that we can see and understand the whole world differently and we will know what we can do to make life better for everyone. Amen. And and I apologize, I forgot to draw your attention in case you haven't noticed it to Margaret Dale Barron's lovely May banner. I was going to do that at the very beginning, and I was going to read what the, it's hard to see unless you hold your newspaper way, way up there and read it. Hard to see that up at the top, these words are inscribed, and, and um, Tony used to say that it was from an unknown author, but it was stitched into a sampler by Mae Morris, the daughter of William Morris. I've noticed on the internet that some people say that Mr. Walter Raleigh um, copied it in English some from somewhere, but nobody really knows where it comes. Anyway, it says, though, and Tony always used to recite this on the first Sunday of May. Though our songs cannot banish ancient wrongs, though they follow where the rose goes, and their sounds swooning over hollow ground fade and leave the enchanted air bare, Yet the wise say that not unblessed he dies who has, who has known a single May Day. So there's Mar Margaret Dale's lovely banner with the maypole and lots of May images. I'm Peter Amidon, the choir can come up. We're gonna sing Open the Eyes of My Heart, which is by Paul Baloche. And I'm gonna tell you what the words are. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart by Paul Baloche. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the 
Our scripture this morning uh, in your bulletin, it indicates it'll be read by Nancy Leach, but Nancy's managing our online presence this morning. So I've asked her sister, Carol Leach, to come up and uh, read the scripture. Thank you, Carol. The first reading is from Acts chapter nine, verses one through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might, them, might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. Ananias. Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. The second reading is from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. But they said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. 
Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. <coughs> when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Thanks be to God. Carol. Uh, I invite you to turn to our hymn number 445, Be Thou My Vision. Please stand if you are able, willing, desiring so.
Please be seated. Oh God, I ask today that the words I'm about to share will mingle with all of our thoughts to make your world a better place. Amen. So once again, good morning, welcome. And I just want to give you a couple of words of warning at this point. Today, you'll learn about Christ the counterintuitive, blindness you were born with, and how to make a left turn in heavy traffic. <laughs> So it's a lot to get through in one uh, morning. I think it's best we start with what's most important, that is how to make that left turn. So let me share a bit about that. Uh, once I was trying to make a left turn, uh, I think maybe I was on Putney Road or a busy place like that where it was two lanes and there wasn't a traffic light to kind of slow things down. And I didn't see a break in the traffic going from left to right that coincided with the traffic going from right to left so that I could cross and make that left turn. After sitting there for several minutes, I realized, well, I could, and I did. There was a break coming from the left to the right, so I slipped into that, turning right, not the way I wanted to go, but then a short ways down, I turned left into a parking lot. I turned around facing Putney Road again, and then I could take a right turn again, slip into the traffic, and go the way I wanted to go. So sometimes, the way to make a left turn in heavy traffic. Um, to turn left, you have to actually go right. And so that reminded me a little bit of our first lesson today, uh, Saul, who made a bit of an unexpected turn in his travel to Damascus. He was the big bad enforcer with a letter from the high priest uh, to find those folks in Damascus who followed Jesus and to bring them to, well, bad things. Uh, so Jesus instead found him on the road, and Saul has a vision that takes away his vision for three days until Ananias comes to sort of resurrect him. And from then on, Saul becomes one of the most effective disciples of Jesus and the new church. Before Ananias came knocking on Saul's door where he was convalescing, Saul's eyes were open, but he saw nothing. Many of us can probably identify with that metaphor here that we can hear, we might be nearsighted or farsighted uh, or even just short-sighted and have difficulty seeing without much help. And like Saul, or excuse me, like, our, like we saw with the paper in the children's message, Looking doesn't mean that we really see anything. Uh, seeing suggests both attention and understanding, a level of comprehension, even some wisdom. In other words, it's really insight that we're looking for, not just sight. So I think it's important to realize that there's a connection between what we actually see with our eyes and how we perceive, understand, and interpret and act in the world. How our eyes register light affects the insight, the wisdom we have about life. And there's a lot that can affect that eyesight. So we think about the many eye ailments that perhaps you've heard of or experienced. There are, of course, cataracts, glaucoma, macular de degeneration, amblyopia. I'm not sure what that is. I didn't bother to look it up. I had a long enough list. Um, <laughs> also including strabismus and detached retinas. And here's an interesting one I found uh, that maybe you didn't expect to learn today on a Sunday morning, which is Betts crystalline dystrophy, BCD. It's a rare inherited eye disease that actually causes crystals in the cornea, the outside layer of the eye. Um, sounds a little familiar with our passage this morning. Poor Saul, uh, immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. So I've had my own experiences with uh, eye infirmities. I had a detached retina, um, and within three days of the, the diagnosis, I was in surgery up at Dartmouth. Um, following that was a week of 
rest and recuperation face down 24 hours a day, um, sleeping, waking, whatever, in order for the procedure to take hold. And that was about three years ago, so um, I'm happy to report I still have a uh, an attached retina rather than a <laughs> detached retina. Um, but um, there are some uh, unforeseen, unexpected side effects. Uh, one of these is kind of a double vision that I experience. Uh, fortunately, if I really pay attention and focus, I can bring the images of my two eyes together. Um, so it's not that much of a problem uh, when driving. You don't need to worry if you see me driving on the road too much. <laughs> Um, but when I'm reading, it can be more of a problem. I really have to concentrate because otherwise I could accidentally read over the same line and end up sounding like, uh, you know, otherwise I could accidentally read over the same line and end up uh, sounding like a broken uh, robot. Yeah. Well, what about your eyes? Um, I'm guessing, in fact, I know they aren't as perfect as they, you think they are, even if you wear glasses or have had something that you've had to deal with. No matter how well you see, each of us has faulty eyes that we were born with. I think this is really interesting. Each of us has a blind spot. This is a scientific term for an area of your eye that actually does not receive light. So your retina is covered with cells that um, are receptive to light and register that, except for the part that isn't covered with that, and that is the part where the optic nerve connects to the eye and sends a message to the rest of your brain. And in that part, there is no way for your eye to receive light, and you actually cannot see that area. Each, each of us has a section in our field of vision of both eyes that's slightly off-centered where you cannot see. And I'm guessing you're skeptical at this point because <laughs> It's probably not something you have ever noticed, but I can show it to you and demonstrate it to you. And I invite you to take out the sheet of paper in your bulletin. Uh, it says visual blind spot. If you're at home, if you can pull that up on your computer and show it on your screen, um, you can play along with us here. The way this works is if you look at this and um, make sure, I always get confused about this part, but uh, what I'd like you to do is cover your right eye, with, close it or cover it with your hand, and then if you look with your left eye at the number one, you should see in the periphery uh, the asterisk off to the left. So just keep focused on the number one and move the paper away slowly, staying focused on the one. Eventually, that asterisk will disappear from your peripheral vision. And if you keep moving it further out, it will probably reappear again. If you're at home and you're using your computer, you can kind of move your face forward, closer, further away um, to your computer screen and get the same effect. So is you're able to see that, see that effect? OK, another way you can do that if you, is, or another way you can learn like how big it is is um, again, find it, close the one eye, find where it disappears, you're focused on the one, and then look at two, three, four, eventually you'll see it again. So you'll see like there's a space like, I don't know, mine's about like that somewhere yeah, over you get, there. You get where you can't see it and then you move it up and down and you get another dimension. Thank you, Tom. So Tom's saying if you also move it up and down, I hadn't thought of that, but <laughs> of course, the, that's, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a circle, right? Um, and not right in the middle. Um, so, another fun fact <laughs> for a Sunday morning, but it's more than just fun. The question is, how is it all of us, as old as we are, as young as we still are and feel, we've never noticed this hole in our vision. Um, we have a remarkable ability to compensate for our shoddy vision, our shoddy eyesight. There are fine muscles that control our eye that make thousands of movements every second and help reposition uh, our field of vision so that we can cover up or catch the light that we're missing in that blind spot, that visual blind spot. Um, so then your subconscious kind of takes all those pieces and parts and stitches them all together into your uh, signals that it sends to your conscious mind to make sense of it. 
And so there's a lot that can go wrong between physical ailments to our eyes and this whole, the work that our subconscious does um, in stitching it together for us. But on top of, in addition to stitching the pieces of light together, we also add in things like memories or emotions or values, creating various biases and so forth and leading us to make conclusions that uh, we may not realize that we're making. And so it's not surprising that it's hard to find true insight and to know what the truth is. Fortunately, we have Christ, the counterintuitive, who enters with a theology of the opposite. So our second lesson speaks to this, I think. After the resurrection, Peter and his buddies, the other disciples, several of them, decide to go fishing. I kind of wonder why they're fishing at night. Um, even with a full moon, I wonder like what they would be able to see or find, but uh, maybe it's different out on the water. Um, but maybe that's why they didn't catch anything either. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, Jesus came along with the light of day, the new morning. He says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Now, Again, you'd think that maybe the disciples had been throwing the net in both directions. Um, perhaps some of the disciples thought they should have pointed that out. Uh, maybe they wanted to point that out to Jesus. But I'm also thinking they knew enough about Jesus and his counterintuitive ways that they decided to give it a try. And of course, when they do, they catch more fish than they ever expected. Jesus says to them, basically, if you aren't getting the results you want, Stop doing the same thing. Fish on the other side of the boat. Try something new. Try my way, he says. Try something that's the opposite. And Jesus is really kind of famous, I think, for suggesting that we do the opposite of what we would typically do. What he taught was, and still is, contrary to popular wisdom. It might be called a the theology of the opposite. So listen to the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And Jesus preached the opposite in many ways, if we stop and think about it. From the very beginning, he was a king as a babe. He said later on, let the children come to me. He ate with tax collectors. He lifted Lazarus from his deathbed. And besides the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, there are many other examples in the parables. Think of the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, both beloved stories that teach us so much, but show us an opposite ending than we would have expected. And in today's lesson, Jesus told, chose Saul and turned him completely around to a whole new person. And of course, there's also the resurrection of Jesus. So it's no wonder the priests, the Pharisees didn't like him. No wonder they thought, saw him as a threat. And it could be a challenge for us as well if we're going to embrace this theology of the opposite. It's going to be uncomfortable, maybe a bit scary, risky. After getting Peter's commitment to feed his sheep, Jesus explains that though Peter had always tightened his belt, made his own decisions, made his own way, that now Jesus was going to do that. It would be the opposite of that. He would go where Jesus would tell him to go. And it was risky for Ananias. He was afraid to go help Saul but Jesus challenged him to do something different. Ananias was told to go to a street called Straight. Go straight ahead, don't hesitate, don't get lost, do not pass go, don't worry, just do it. In order for God to turn Saul around, Ananias was asked to do something counterintuitive, to fish on the other side of the boat, and Ananias, as a result, restored Saul's sight and gave him insight. Saul became the opposite of himself. New name, new pro profession, a whole new mission. 
So I, I think it would be easy for us to say um, that this theology of the opposite worked in Jesus' time, uh, but maybe not so much today. And yet, I think there are examples when we look for them. Uh, there's my advice to turn left in order, or, uh, to turn left, go right instead. Or there's the nonviolence of Mahatma Gandhi as practiced by Martin Luther King. Many martial arts uh, direct the opponent's energy rather than, or redirect the energy rather than meeting it head on. Right here in Guildford, there's um, an organization that trains horses, but actually they're not training horses, they're training people to understand the language of horses rather than using literal carrots and sticks. And not too dissimilar, when I worked in New Hampshire for an organization that assists people with disabilities, the teaching was something that was called gentle teaching. In other words, not using rewards, not using threats, but finding another way to connect with an individual to help them learn and to be a better person. We can also see many opposites in the prayer of St. Francis. I invite you to read it again uh, after today's service and notice how many things uh, are opposites that are presented there. And often on Communion Sunday, we sing a song usually led by Margaret Dale Behrend, but it, the first line is, I come like a beggar with a gift, a gift in my hand. A practical question, I think, is what would life look like if we were to listen to the counterintuitive teachings of Jesus? Conventional wisdom accounts for many of the issues that are hurting societies throughout the world. With, what would things be like if we followed a theology of the opposite? What would international relationships be like? What would politics, religion, or the environment be like? What about race relations or even the global pandemic if we did the opposite of what we have been doing? I read an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago um, was talking about loneliness. And it said that even before the pandemic, loneliness was a problem. The Surgeon General had named it to be a, of epidemic. <laughs> Uh, scale similar to what we see with the opiate crisis or diabetes in our country. And one study compared the physical effects of loneliness, not just the mental effects, but the actual what happens to your body, effects of loneliness to be like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So, the article said, for years people have thought the best thing you could do for a lonely person was to give them support. But actually, the best thing you can do is to ask them for help. So you give them a sense of worth and a chance to be altruistic. And I think even some of our good intentions might be better with a theology of the opposite. I know in many of our schools we have campaigns to stop bullying. But what if we did the opposite and had a campaign about making friends? Or yes, racism is something that we want to end, but if we took the opposite and we celebrated differences, what would the effect be? And yes, let's end up hunger, uh, but the opposite I think is even better, which might be something like, let's have good nutrition for everybody. Sometimes I think doing the opposite <clears throat> makes things easier, like turning right in order to turn left. But other times it's difficult, risky, scary, like taking a stand when it's unpopular, but it's something that promotes justice for everybody. I think following Christ, the counterintuitive means turning away from conventional wisdom. And like the Shaker song, when true simplicity is gained, to bow and bend will not be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight if turning turning, we come round right. Time after time, turn after turn, 
Jesus challenges us to take a risk, to throw off our blinders, to cast our net on the opposite side. Imagine what you will catch. Amen. Amen. Jesus, please grant us the ability to see beyond the physical, mental, and emotional limitations of our vision to, to obtain true insight. Help us to avoid the easy answers of conventional wisdom and give us the courage to risk change and to take the opposite way. Amen. This is Sending You Light by Melanie Damore. The words are, I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. No matter where you go, no matter where you've been, you'll never walk alone. I feel you deep within. No matter what you feel or what you choose to show, I'm always there for you, and so I want you to know I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you in love. Thank you, Melanie Damore. I am sending you light to heal you, to hold you. I am sending you light to hold you. Now is the time in our service where we are you passing out prayers for yeah if, if you have prayers that you'd like uh, to share please write them on the cards that Fred is passing out we have some from online but let us pray Almighty God, we give you thanks today that we are able to be here together in the presence of your beloved community. 
Thank you also for the healing and hope which has come to, to us this week and for your strength and love in our lives. Because you are so ready to hear our prayers and so willing to give us hope and healing, we ask that you bless these members of thy living body for whom we ask thy care. Prayers for all who faced crises of life and health. Bless their families and all who care for them that they might find your comfort and presence in this time of suffering. For all who suffer from cancer and who carry the ongoing threat of cancer's recurrence and for their families and all who support them, give them peace and health. For all who are imprisoned rightfully or wrongfully, that they might find hope and true justice. Grant their families the courage and support they need. For our men and women in uniform throughout the world and for their families and for the people of Ukraine. We ask for healing for all children who are suffering. Bless them and all families with healing and courage. For young adults and their parents, that they might be given the help and guidance they need. For all elders of our church community and of the world, that they might be loved, honored, and cared for. For all in the world whose lives are filled with the darkness of hunger, illness, homelessness, anxiety, poverty, or isolation, and for those who seek to help them. And for all who live amidst violence and the threat of violence, bring peace to their hearts, their homes, and their nations. Guide our community and world leaders to find the bridges they need to peace and world service and the means possible for healing our planet, that we become true stewards of the earth and of each other. And finally, dear God, grant that all people may hear together the song of joy and find their homes in the garden of justice and hope that we may experience, experience the fullness of life, which is your will for all in the coming of Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Christ's name we pray, Lord, hear our prayer. There are prayers now of the prayers of the people for peace in Ukraine and throughout the world. Prayers for the, those with debilitating chronic illness, both mental and physical. Prayers for Mary Mader. Prayers for Mary Hall, struggling with chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. Prayers for the Berend and Ehrenberg families. Prayers for healing for my brother-in-law, Herb, with a broken leg bone and dementia, and my sister, Emily, caregiver, and their son, Chris, healing after knee replacement, all in Florida. This is from Carolyn and Lee. And prayers for Benjamin Arthur Thomas, to outgrow lying. Prayers for Al Franklin and for Bernice LaRock. Now let us join together in the Lord's Prayer using whatever words 
bring forth its meaning to, to you. Let us pray. Our Father, our Mother, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we have an opportunity to create a virtuous cycle. By our generosity of giving, we also receive. And by our receiving, we have more to give. Let us bring forward our gifts of time, talent, and treasure. God, we thank you for the gifts you have embodied in each one of us. Please use what we have shared today to make your will real in our community and across the world. Amen. 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 I invite you to pass the peace to one another.
closing hymn is our closing hymn, hymn is in the bulletin. Peter, you have some yeah. advice. So this flower carol is the original, um, it's a 14th century Latin hymn, and the tune was stolen by the fellow who wrote Good King Wenceslas. But this is the original. And here comes, watch out, here come the accordions. It's in your bulletin. Be careful of uh, too many accordions, right? That's fantastic, thank you. So that brings us to a good closure for this morning. So my final thoughts for you, to invite you to join us after the service, uh, when Andy will be leading us in the Maypole dance right outside our church. Um, and let that time be a, the turning of the dance, be the first of our turning away from conventional wisdom, instead to Christ the counterintuitive, that we may learn to embrace and embody his theology of the opposite. Amen. Amen.
Thank you so much, Franz, for your beautiful playing today. Uh, are there any quick uh, church-related announcements we can uh, be so that we can not, not delay until our maple dancing any longer? Um, Just mention you don't need to know anything to do this maple dancing. Right. Dance. You don't need to know anything in order to join in the maple dancing. Andy will tell you everything you need to know. Um, the one announcement that I wanted to make sure and make, and Lucy, do you have another? Um, is uh, on the 14th of May, Saturday, we're going to have our annual spring cleanup day here at church. So mark your calendars for Saturday morning. Come for whatever small or big part of the time that you can come. Hi, I'm Lucy Sparblase. Uh, Jeremy Kirk, who is our member in discernment up until 3 o'clock this afternoon, is going to be ordained and installed as the settled pastor of the West Dover Community Church. All are invited. I'm going over early for choir rehearsal. If anybody would like to come with me, let me know after the service. Good morning, my name is Teresa. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm here with Friends of Large Southern Vermont, and we are so happy to be here with you today to celebrate the Maypole. So please introduce yourselves to us. Wave your hands over there for our friends, and there will be some more Friends of Large Southern Vermont coming um, to participate. And L'Arche is an international organization and we're working to establish a community here in Southern Vermont, building community for people with and without intellectual differences. So thank you for having us. Are there birthdays to celebrate? Josh. Next week is my younger sister's birthday, May 8th. Soon she'll turn 25. Okay, your younger sister, May 8th, turning 25. Again? I have Maria. She, she's better known as Maria. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Lila will be 15 tomorrow. Oh. Lila will be 15 tomorrow? Uh, um, I can't see it. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, yeah. Brett Freeman was 44 yesterday, and my aunt Antron is 91 today. Okay, so it was a, a nephew? My mother's youngest sister. Okay, your youngest sister, and all right, and turning 90 plus something. Okay, thank you. Lucy. My nephew Chaz turned 38. Nephew Chaz turned 38. Um, oh, yes. My daughter Sarah turned 8. Oh, on the 18th. Your daughter Sarah on the 18th. Anybody else? Happy birthday. Happy birthday, we love you. Happy birthday, and may all your dreams come true. When you blow out the candles, one light stays aglow. It's the love light in your eyes wherever you go. One last thought, Josh. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that our brother Drew's having a birthday later this month at the end of the month on the 31st. He'll turn 30. Okay, so another person coming up on the 31st. So that's yeah. okay. Great, thank you. And Andy, can you do something with that accordion to I'm lead us out it, here? And if someone pulls the door up and I'm right outside, <laughs> okay. you can follow me, but you can go at any door as long as you walk in that direction. So <laughs> I'll find the beautiful flowering. Uh, white tree, whatever, whatever that tree is. Thank you. Yeah, follow on. You can play if you want.